Hi again, me again. Uh, real quickly, so uh, last fall, the watershed staff had the opportunity to attend a uh, the kind of conference that the watershed staff uh, would enjoy attending. Um, I'll let you fill in whatever blanks you need to fill in, uh, but the title of this conference was called Theology Beer Camp. So it was great. Uh, and we, we got to hang out with a lot of uh, speakers and authors and thinkers, many of whom uh, we've introduced you to in the past, uh, Roberto uh, Che Espinoza, uh, Pete Enns, Jennifer Garcia Bashaw, um, all great, all lovely. We love them all. You'll see them again. Uh, but there was one uh, person who we did not previously know who we were introduced to, uh, one Dr. Leah Robinson. And on our way back, you know, because we, we, we all kind of minivanned up there, um, on our way back, we were all kind of reflecting on the experience and we're like, do you know who we all really liked? We all really liked Leah. She just had a good vibe and she was hilarious. So fast forward to couple months ago, and uh, we needed some, some coverage for this current series, and we were thinking, who do we know? Who would be, who would be fun to introduce our people to? And uh, pretty unanimously, almost like serendipitously, synchronicity, all, whatever that word is, um, we all kind of sound with this, like, ah, who was that person at beer camp we all loved? And we looked it up, and it's like, yeah, Leah Robinson. So found her email address on her uh, employment page um, at, at the university that she works at, and um, shot her a quick email, and she was like, yeah, that'd be great. Sounds like fun. I live like an hour, uh, a mile from y'all, uh, so that's perfect. Well, in the time since then, we've become aware of like all these other opportunities that after today we're going to get to like get to know Leah a little bit better. She's got a book coming out. The book release is going to be at Petty Thieves, the official brewery of Watershed. Um, <laughs> And then we're going to be hosting a big event this summer that you're going to hear more about in the near future uh, that Leah is going to be a part of as well. So um, that's all I'm going to say for now. I want, I want uh, Leah to be able to introduce uh, herself to you uh, in her own words. Uh, but we, would you just uh, warmly, warmly welcome uh, Dr. Leah Robinson up to the stage this morning. Thank you. Whoa. Um, Hi, everybody. I can't see any of you. <laughs> um, I am, well, first of all, thanks for that warm introduction. Um, as you're going to see as I do my talk today, anytime that I get to uh, be in front of you all, even if I can't, oh, now I can. Yeah, if I get like, I'm quite tall as well. So, um, But anytime I get to be in front of uh, a group of people in this setting um, is always an honor uh, to me. So I want to thank David, and I want to thank you all for, for having me here. Uh, I'm not an hour away. I'm 1.7 miles away. So uh, I'm going to put my phone here, because not because I'm going to be looking at it, um, but I talk a lot. And I'm sure you've never experienced that at this church. Um, but I'm going to make sure I don't talk too long. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for, for having me. Uh, yeah, I, I met some of you at uh, Theology Beer Camp, and it was quite the experience. Hopefully, if you've not been, you can go next year. I think I'm still invited, so uh, I, I might be there. Um, so I wanted to go ahead and give you a little bit of an introduction to me. Uh, and I do have slides. I'm a teacher by trade, so I apologize for the slides ahead of time. <laughs> I don't really need them. Um, I've been doing this both ministry and teaching now for 20 years-ish. I'm way older than I look. Um, <laughs> no, please, stop it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Don't don't say anything. Oh, this is better. I can see some of you now. Um, so one of the things that I like to do in general is just to introduce you to me. While I do have a lot of nerdy attributes, I also have some that are uh, not so nerdy. Uh, <laughs> also, I'm super good with technology. So you can see these pictures that I completely own. I completely own, by the way, all of them. Um, I... Uh, which one should I start with? Well, but the, oh, overwhelmingly. I'm glad for that participation because I'm going to have to have you answer questions for me in, in the future. Spoiler alert. Cats, 
I have three of them. Yes, I'm, yeah, I, they're all rescues too. Yay. Um, <laughs> varying degrees of insanity between them all. Um, so I love cats. We will move to the dog next. Uh, I also have a dog too, but most importantly, I'm a huge University of Georgia fan. Any bulldogs out there? Go to yes. I got a way less receptive uh, answer to that at beer camp. It was just sort of like, Argh. so uh, red wine, if I see you out at whatever your sponsored brewery is of the day, um, you will probably see me with some red wine. Uh, also Scotland there, you can see. Uh, I have a deep connection to Scotland, which is how I know some of those folks at beer camp. I taught at the University of Edinburgh and the University of Glasgow. And then you'll see uh, the bad theology stuff. <laughs> And I'm going to talk to you about that. Um, that's what my next book is called, is Bad Theology. That's it. <laughs> um, I, had, I had a different name, but that one seemed to be a bit more um, sexy, so we, we stuck with that. So that's a little bit of my, quote, mood board. Uh, my CV, because uh, I'm sure you guys care very deeply about... <laughs> where I did my education. Um, I went to Shorter College in Georgia. I'm originally from Georgia, uh, hence the bulldog thing. Uh, I got my uh, bachelor's there before, I said before it got weird. Um, if you look it up, you can see <laughs> it got weird. Um, <laughs> I don't have a QR code, I'm sorry. <laughs> For any of this. I'm deeply, deeply amazed, by the way, at how techy you guys are. That's, uh, it's great. Uh, again, quite old. Uh, I got my MDiv at Mercer University. Uh, and then I got my PhD at, at Edinburgh. And I've taught mostly in Scotland, to be honest, um, and now some in the United States. Although that will uh, end May 1st. And then, I don't know, maybe I'll become a massage therapist or... <laughs> a yoga instructor, I don't know, the, or a cat farm. The possibilities are simply endless for us MDiv folks. <laughs> um, so that's me. Uh, there's a lot more, uh, but those are the kind of things you share over, again, a glass of wine and a discussion of cats. So, um, so moving on. Um, slide. Yes. Oh, yeah. So. I teach predominantly in practical theology, and again, I do not want to bog you down with the boringness that is academia. I'm sure you get that a lot from your ministers here. Maybe. maybe. <laughs> um, it's kind of fun to reside between both worlds, uh, which is also, you know, ministry and academia. But it is, I did want to because it's very pertinent to what I'm going to be talking to you about today, I did want to make kind of an explanation about the world of theology. Typically, when people study theology or the study of God, if you want to call it that, um, they usually fall within two worlds. And the two worlds are systematic theology and practical theology. I do practical theology. And yes, the joke is, it's practically theology. We've heard it. We know. Um, systematic theologians, I uh, are in the academy anyway, tend to talk about God as though they're BFFs. And it's quite interesting. So, for instance, I, I am, <laughs> when I walked in, I was like, Rob Bell, I remember him. He ruined my teenage life. <laughs> Glad he's on the up and up. <laughs> um, but he would typically do stuff that's that's probably on the borderlands, I would say, between, I haven't read uh, Love Wins, but on the borderlands between systematics and um, practical. Uh, but people, uh, as you mentioned before, uh, Mr. Piper would probably see himself as a systematic theologian. Uh, practical theology is basically the idea that theology is only theology if it is actually lived out. So a lot of times 
people will talk about God, like I said, as if they, they know God or they know God's intentions for the world or they have some sort of direct line. I've been doing this for a long time and I've yet to get the phone number. Um, maybe, maybe one day. Um, so, or they have an idea based on interpretation of text that they think is, is how the world should be. Practical theologians are not quite so egotistical. Um, uh, and we just like to see how people live out their theology. We're interested in the human aspect of it. So one time I was at a conference in, in the before times, as we call them, and or I guess in the middle times, and it was about COVID and theology. And someone asked me, and they ask me all the time, what is practical theology? A lot of times people say practical theology is theology that is uh, embodied, and there are some people that, that have debated that because, you know, we all have different bodies. They look very different. Some of us love our bodies. Uh, some of us uh, have trouble with our bodies. And so I always thought the body thing was a little um, difficult sometimes to wrestle with. So, and this was right after the George, George Floyd uh, murder. And I remember, and also people all around me were, were dying of covid and I just kind of blurted out, practical theology is theology that's breathed. So as long as we have a voice, whether it is spoken or written or any kind of way uh, that you might breathe, then you are able to do practical theology. You're able to live out your theology in the world. And so whenever I got the, I'm so glad this is here, I had a moment, no jokes aside, where I was like, I'm gonna have to read that. And I don't know about you, but I'm putting off getting glasses, and it's really reaching a critical point <laughs> of putting it off. Because I was watching them read that, and I was like, there's no way. That's just a blur. So this is delightful. Um, so when, when your ministers gave me um, the, the assignment, <laughs> as it were, uh, they talked about this idea of reclaiming. And immediately, I thought, my voice. I want to, to I want to talk about reclaiming your voice. We just made it through a really quite traumatic time, and we've talked about it a lot. And now that we're kind of, I'm going to say, moving our way to the other side of it, um, we're not completely out of it, I'm sure. The idea of breath and voice just felt really important to me, and I realized that whether I knew it or not, I'd actually spent most of my career trying to reclaim my voice, and I'm gonna tell you again, uh, spoiler alert, what I had to reclaim it from. Um, but I, I loved religion from the very beginning. I loved theology, I loved talking about religion, and I, however, grew up Southern Baptist, um, and that's gonna come into play as well. I'm not here at all to, to bash any denominational bodies, but it was difficult to have a voice in that scenario. And so in the deep South as well, uh, growing up in Georgia in the Southern Baptist Church um, was, was quite difficult. So, but I never stopped loving the religion of my childhood. That was the religion of my grandma and my mama and, and all them, <laughs> Mom, mama and them, mama and them. And so I, d I didn't think it was fair that just because my voice had been taken away for a short time that they got to have my religion. And so that was something that, that I really held on to. So I tried to find my space. And those of you who are here, I can look around and how accommodating and how wonderful this space is. Um, maybe you also have tried to find your space in the world, find your voice. And it's not always easy. Uh, so cherish what, what you have here. And I, I don't mean that uh, trite, uh, it's, it's beautiful. All right, so reclaiming, how do we do that? Slide. Uh, so I basically became the thing that they told me that I couldn't, uh, which was a minister and a teacher and a writer and I realized that throughout my career, as I was reclaiming my voice, I was also deeply interested in what other people were reclaiming. And so I wrote my dissertation on the people of Northern Ireland and the struggles that they had been through and 
them trying to reclaim a sense of who they were as a group. As I went through uh, my career, I also started writing about um, the civil rights movement, and also that book that you saw there we're gonna come back to, which is Feminist Trauma Theology, uh, Women Regaining Their Voice in a Variety of Different Worlds. It's a lot of words on the page, but it's basically to say, I'm writing stuff. Um, my most, uh, most new, yeah, most new, we're gonna go with that, uh, is gonna be in September 2025, and it's called Born Perfect or A Boy Erased Christian Theology in the Ex-Gay Movement in the USA. And so I'm moving now to a different world. I'm gonna interview people who uh, went through um, and survived uh, conversion therapy, which if you know uh, anything about that world, I, I hope that you don't. But if you do, uh, it's, it's a pretty rough situation, especially in terms of your voice. And I'm, I'm basically going to interview people and let them tell me the story. So again, if any of you have been a part of that, bless, bless you deeply. Um, but I would love to hear from you as well. Um, so let's get back to the subject at hand. Anyone in here who maybe grew up in the tradition that I did hates this verse. I hate it. <laughs> Uh, now, you typically don't say you hate the Bible because, you know, that's probably not a great thing to say when I'm standing up here in front of you, but I hate this verse. And there's probably some verses you hold on to in your own heart of hearts that you don't particularly like either. <laughs> um, just because you have a sacred text doesn't mean you have to like every word written in it um, or what people do with it. So in my book on feminist trauma theology, I write about uh, women's ordination and the struggle. And it's from my own perspective. It's a autoethnography, and I talk about my own self and my own voice in the Baptist church growing up. And this verse says, as in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent. Sorry. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> um, this verse has been used in a multitude of different ways, but perhaps most famously uh, to deny women's ordination in the church. Uh, needless to say, I'm quite against that. <laughs> uh, the verse, not the ordination. Um, so I write about that in the, the text. And again, I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into that. To the next slide. So one of the other things uh, that I talked about is that I wrote uh, about Northern Ireland. And in the feminist trauma theology, it was really about finding my own voice and telling my own story. In this, it was, this book, it was about telling other people's stories and letting them have a voice. If you know anything about history, you'll know that Northern Ireland has struggled uh, throughout with um, war basically, since its incarnation. And the wars between Catholics and Protestants, it goes deeper than that. Um, but again, you can, you can read the book if you want to find out about it. Um, but one of the things that I did do is I, I interviewed people who felt like their voices had been lost. And one of the quotes that I have here says, I banged on the door of the police station to tell them that my daughter had been shot in the street. She was going to a movie in a Catholic neighborhood. I screamed for them to open the door, and they did not respond. I could see the lights. I knew they were there, but as much as I yelled, they equally just ignored me. It was though I wasn't even there. And so this is an interview from, from someone in Northern Ireland. Um, next slide, please. I also wrote about the civil rights movement. One thing about being a practical theologian is you get bored really fast. Um, and so you're always looking to the next thing. Uh, a church that's lost its voice for justice is a church that has lost its relevance in the world. And what I noticed, and the reason I'm going through these is not to uh, at all say buy these books. I make like three cents, I think, off of everything. <laughs> so it'll be a while before I'm a millionaire. But it's to say that when I actually analyzed what I had written, I realized that I was looking at places that in some ways reflected my own story, places that had lost their voice, people who had lost their voice, and I was trying to give them a platform. And I realized that uh, 
trust me, I am no saint, I am no martyr. Um, get me some uh, <laughs> red wine and cat discussions and I'll tell you all about it. Um, but I did like the idea that I could use my position and use my education to be able to lift up people who feel as though they've lost their voice. And so that's what I've done. Uh, that's my background. So, <laughs> this is my new book. <laughs> it's a doozy. Um, it took a while to write this. To call a book bad theology, you have to have some years under your belt. Um, and I realized that as I was giving people this platform to speak, I was telling their story, and I certainly was, was talking about my own in terms of uh, voice as well. But then I kind of got mad. <laughs> and if you're a baby academic uh, or even a baby minister, you have to wait a little while to get mad. You got to be a couple years in. Uh, I've now been in academia for 13 years, so now I'm mad. <laughs> Righteously mad, though. Um, and so while I was lifting up these folks and, and giving them a platform to speak, what I also realized is I wanted to get at the heart of why they didn't have a voice. What is the core? What is the reason why I have to write a book on feminist trauma theology or on the ex-gay movement and conversion therapy? Because there's some really, really, can I curse? shitty theology out there. And it's my opinion, but I'm going to write about it. And that's what this book is about. Uh, it's about the reason why we have to have safe spaces for people and why we have to write books so that people can actually hear about experiences. Why are there not hundreds of books on the shelves that talk about the burden that women bear from the beginning of our lives or the why is there not thousands of books on this conversion therapy stuff that happened right under our own noses? I mean, I'm a 90s kid. It was happening. That was the peak of it happening. Why are the shelves not lined with these books? And it's because as a whole, not everybody, but as a whole, we accepted that bad theology just was. And it ruled the day, and it pushed the church forward. And again, these are gross generalizations, but it made it so that it was just accepted as reality. And so this book says, no, it doesn't have to be that. And I'm a professional, I'm a minister, I've been a chaplain, I've been a youth minister, um, I've done all of this, I've been on stages talking to, you know, 300 students at a time, and I'm telling you, as someone who's worked in this world, there's bad theology. You don't have to agree with it. You may think, hey, that's pretty good theology. I, I, I think that's pretty good, and that's fine. But there needs to be another voice out there, because we've accepted this for too long. So that's the book, Coming to Shelves, this year, next month, maybe. Um, now, some people would say, you're writing a book called Bad Theology. How dare you think you can reinterpret God's words? How dare you think you can create a world based on your interpretations? And how dare you call something bad? Why the hell not? I had someone tell me that I can't talk in church. Someone tell you that that is bad theology. My voice is God's gift to me, as they sang about in that song. And I'm going to use it. Um, and so this book is a way to reclaim that part of myself. One of the things that I like to look at um, whenever I'm doing any kind of sermon is, you know, I, am, I did grow up Southern Baptist. I did carry some of the Bible stuff with me. Uh, I'm not a biblical scholar by <laughs> any means. In fact, my line is, I don't touch the Bible. I'm a theologian. <laughs> um, I, just, I just tell you what other people think about it. Um, but whenever I was thinking about reclaiming voices, I didn't want to just talk about my publications. I wanted to do a proper sermon for you. And so I started to compare and contrast the way that God's voice is portrayed in the text versus human voices. And I had never really thought about that. Like, 
how is God shown um, to speak in comparison to the way humans are speaking? These are some verses uh, from the Old and New Testament about God talking. And I was trying to explain this to my, my dear husband here who's, who's uh, in the corner, uh, yay Scotland. And, you know, <laughs> the way he was describing it, he was like, you kind of describe God as like this sort of old guy who's like smoking weed and just like real chill, like the dude, you know. And I was like, I mean, yeah, kind of. Because if you look at some of the verses, uh, you'll see that God's pretty together, you know. If you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commandments, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I bought on the, brought on the Egyptians. Great. Uh, pretty confident. Uh, and, of course, God's talking and saying, you know, I'm keeping my covenants. I'm keeping my promises to you. I still got your back. I know stuff is tough, but I'm still here for you. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. Heaven opened up. The Holy Spirit descended, and a voice came from heaven. You are my son, who I love, and who I'm well pleased. Again, chill, right? We won't get into that whole, like, Sodom and Gomorrah thing that's going to really mess with the chill vibe. But you get what I'm saying. There's confidence there. There's, there's confidence in what we're, we're, we're seeing from God. Slide. Oh, yeah. Man, got it. Uh, again, uh, a lot of promises. God is not only, you know, saying uh, I am chill and I love you, but also I'm going to protect you. So very protective God. No weapon forged against you will prevail. Um, you know, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Their vindication from me declares the Lord. A lot of declaring happening from God. Now let's fast forward a little bit. Human voices. Are they chill like that in the text? No. Out of the depths I cry to you. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. Another verse. In my distress I call to you, Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple he heard my voice. My cry came from him. Two different understandings there. Job, oh, gosh. If, if your ministers ever preach on Job, just give them a little bit of grace. There's a lot going on. There's a lot going on in that book. Job's having a tough time, right? It's the whole point of Job. Well, I don't know what the point of Job is, honestly, but when I read it, He's having, a, he's having a tough time. I cry out to you, God, but you do not answer. I stand up, but you merely look at me. You turn on me ruthlessly. You snatch me up. I know you will bring me down to death to the place appointed for all the living. What are we seeing when we compare human voices to God's voices in these texts? You don't have to answer, it's fine. It's not a call and response. The humans are doing a lot of crying, aren't they? They're doing a lot of, of falling on the ground and, and kind of punching the sky and saying, I'm weeping, I'm crying, I am reaching out to you. You have Jesus. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I'm sure that was a cry. And when he said that, he breathes his last. Human voices in the text are not the same as God's voices. The verses that we see, it's not the same. And that's okay. Uh, when we talk about reclaiming our voice, I think a lot of times people expect us to talk the way that God talks in the text. But actually what we see is that the humans are not talking that way. They are crying out. They are asking for things. They are making their complaints known. Job curses the day that he was ever born. 
oftentimes when people talk to us about how we are supposed to be or how we are supposed to act, they talk to us in a way that makes it seem as though we're supposed to be like God in these texts. And my argument is to reclaim your voice is to look more like the humans in the text and for that to be okay. You know, it's okay to get upset and to yell. It's also okay to praise at the top of your lungs. But we shouldn't be expected to be like God in the verses. And I know that's controversial, but I'm, I'm saying it. I don't think we are. Here's an example. Little Leah. I'm Leah, by the way. Or Leia, if you're into the, the Star Wars thing. <laughs> My husband is. Um, I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church, as I said, and one of the stories that I tell in this book at the very beginning is kind of a well-worn story once, once you do these things. You have a couple of those. I felt very called to be a minister. I, I, I felt it in my soul in whatever way you want to define calling. And I went to my minister, uh, my head minister at the time, and I said, uh, you know, I, I was probably, I don't know what age I say in the book, but probably about 11 or 12. And I said, you know, I feel as though I am called to this ministry and I want to do what you do. I think I told, and, and again, keep in mind, little Southern, I probably talked a little bit more like this. I feel like that's what I'm supposed to do. You know, I hadn't got my Edinburgh D twang on yet. And this gentleman who was there, he looked at me with all the love in his heart, I should say, not an angry bone there, and said, oh, honey, you can't be a minister. And I said, but why? And he said, well, that's just what God said. God said you can't. Now, later, of course, there's added layers to that, you know. Uh, what is it? Women are too emotional. Women are, you know, too scatterbrained. I don't know. Fill in the blank. Socially, we've added reasons to that. But at that moment, I felt so small. And I was small. But I couldn't understand it. I could not contemplate why I shouldn't be allowed to stand in front of people like yourselves and speak. I didn't get it. And so I went to the corner. Uh, I left the office, went to the corner, and I cried. I cried my little 12-year-old heart out because I just didn't get it. I didn't get why my voice wasn't good enough. There is... Um, a young man named Jack McIntyre, and I'm gonna write about him in this book on the conversion therapy stuff. Jack was a part of Love in Action, which uh, these, these kind of awful things tend to brand themselves in delightful names, right? Um, Love in Action was one of the conversion therapy things, uh, groups, I guess you could call them. And Jack McIntyre was in this for four years, and he's quoted as saying, to continually go before God and ask for forgiveness and make promises you know you can't keep is more than I can take. There are consequences when you lose your voice. I was lucky because I found it again. Uh, but not everyone does. When you feel like you... Uh, you have a voice and you're not heard, you can start to feel like you don't exist or that you don't matter. And I think one of the greatest messages that the church can give people and that needs to give people and to correct after all this time is that you do matter. You're a child of God and you matter. And you don't need me to tell you that. Uh, but the church needs to start saying that and needs to start meeting us where we are. I argue that our voices are our greatest gift from God, and there's this 
verse here, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. It's a gift, that voice. And the people who try to tell you that you can't use yours for ministry, for uh, theology, for anything to do with religion, um, they're limiting that gift. Slide, yep. What's the consequences? Well, my story, I, st- I think, I mean, I'm not at the end of my life yet, but I felt pretty happy. Uh, I was able to, to find a community um, and to find another way to be religious. That young man, Jack, uh, he actually uh, did not survive the conversion therapy. He took his own life. Um, this is a quote from his uh, suicide note. I should have done triggers, I'm sorry. To those left with the question, why did he do it? And this is him writing. I must confess that there were things in my life that I could not gain control of, no matter how much I prayed and tried to avoid the temptation I continuously failed. It is this constant failure that has made me make a decision to terminate my life here on earth. If I remain, it could possibly allow the devil the opportunity to lead me away from the Lord. I love my life, but my love for the Lord is so much greater. The choice is simple. It is the continuing lack of strength and or lack of obedience and or lack of willpower to cast aside certain sins. To continually go before God and ask forgiveness and make promises I know I can't keep is more than I can take. I feel it is making a mockery of God and all he stands for in my life. I regret if I bring sorrow to those that are left behind. If you get your heart in tune with the word of God, you will be as happy about my transfer as I am. I also hope that this answers sufficiently the question, why? May God have mercy on my soul, a brother and a friend. Jack McIntyre. I never want to read a letter like that again. And I never want to meet another young girl who feels as though she can't be everything that she wants to be in life. We have to reclaim our voices. We have to let other people or help other people reclaim their voices because the consequences are too dire. There are a bunch of other groups that I haven't mentioned that need to reclaim their voices and have their voices heard. And if you're a part of any of those groups, I would love to hear from you. So let's go out into the world and do our Christian faith in a way that is reflective of the human voices. We can absolutely read God's voice and love what God says or argue with what God says, Um, but just know that the human voice is important and your voice does matter. I say let us pray, but I don't want you to bow your head. Who told us to bow our heads? It's respect, that's fine. But for me, this time around, I want you to say it out loud. Use your voice. You don't have to, of course. It's like my students. Follow your heart. (laughs) Um, But as I say, let us pray. I want to know, what is it today that you want God to hear from you? Keeping in mind that sometimes it's painful. Sometimes it's wonderful. Uh, Is it happiness, joy, or anger? So say it now. What is it today that you want God to hear from you? Peace. Perhaps you said it in your head. 
I love my inner voice. I sometimes hate it, but generally I love it. I'll end this with a verse. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. Amen.